get into uh, this series that we've been speaking about in the book of Titus. And if you can, you open your Bibles with me to the book of Titus chapter 1. And I'm just going to give you a rundown of what we spoke about a week and a half ago, where we shared a little bit on the introduction of the book of Titus and the importance of it and what Paul was trying to convey to Titus when he gave them when he gave him a specific job to do in the island of Crete. And we looked at verses 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. And in verse 1, if you remember, we talked about Paul as he introduces himself in this epistle to Titus. And Paul right away calls himself a servant of God. And we talked about how that word servant also meant slave. And how at that point, Paul is stressing to Titus that he is not just a servant of God, but he is a slave of God. And he has placed himself under the command of God. He didn't come to him in the beginning and he says, Paul, I'm an apostle, I'm a bishop, I'm a leader. He didn't talk about a, 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 an appointment that he had been given. But he talks about the first and foremost important thing in leadership which is servanthood to God. And he speaks of himself as being the servant of God. Then we talked about Paul and his calling as an apostle and how it was very different from the rest of the apostles, but it was yet an, a calling made by God to Paul for a specific job. Then we went on to verse 2, 3, and 4, and we talked about the hope of eternal life. And now we go to verse 5. And if you're with me, you just say amen. And we'll read verse 5 all together, and I'm reading from the King James translation. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And then he says, And ordain elders in every city as I had appointed Amen. thee. Let us we'll continue in verse 5 here. And Paul gives Titus some instructions. He says, For this cause I left thee in Crete. And Paul's significant wording here shows us that he trusted Titus with the job that he had left him. He tells him that he should set the things that are, uh, that are in order, need to be set in order. And within there, he tells him to ordain elders in every city. And then he says, do it the same way I've taught you, or the same way I did it with you also. But it's evident here that Paul is giving Titus a specific task. It's also noteworthy to, to see that Titus was a co-worker, not solely based on friendship with Paul, but that Titus was also a worker in the early church. He had a specific job. Paul not only sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but he recognized that the guy that he was leaving in this island to set the work in order was a man that could be trusted by God. It was a man of God. Titus was a man of God for Paul, and Paul knew this. Titus was a man of God whose character and leadership were trustworthy. Titus had already demonstrated to Paul, as we're going to see here soon, he had already demonstrated to him that he was ready for such an important task. If you go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 23, we're going to notice here that Paul is speaking of the same Titus that you and I are studying about today. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 23, the Word of God says to us, Whether any do inquire of Titus, Listen to how he describes Titus, Paul here. He is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. So that's the same Titus we're talking about is also found in the second letter to the Corinthians. And he's describing, Paul describes him here, not just as any person, not just as a minister, but he says, look, he's a partner and he's a fellow helper in the ministry. Then he says, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. So Paul refers to Titus as his partner and fellow helper, indicating that there was a 
close relationship. And we're looking at verse 5 here. Remember, in the book of Titus. He also spoke of Titus' zeal. And I know that our brother mentioned that word here in 2 Corinthians 7. And we're not going to turn there, but he spoke of Titus' zeal where he says that God comforted them through the words of Titus. So again, what we're seeing here is that the man that Paul is leaving to set the things in order of the churches in Crete was a trusted man of leadership in the church. These references show that Titus was not only trusted, but he was a dedicated worker in the ministry. But what does he tell him? He says, look, Titus, I left you for this cause, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting. What, what was he trying to tell Paul there? Paul was trying to tell Titus that he was left there to begin to appoint elders or pastors in every one of those local churches. Paul was demonstrating his confidence in the leadership abilities and the character of Titus. He knew that Titus would carry out this work with wisdom, discernment, and a deep concern for the well-being of the church of God at that time. He recognized the importance of qualified leadership in the church. Paul trusted Titus to appoint pastors who would ensure the spiritual health and vitality of the church during that time. It was so important to him. So he leaves him there. Isn't this the same thing that should be working among us today in the church of God? It remains true today where leadership must be appointed essentially for maintaining the purity of the gospel message. Providing spiritual guidance and protection for the members of the church. That's the elder's job. That's the pastor's job. To maintain the purity of the gospel message. Not to stray away from it. And at the same time, as he is maintaining the purity of the gospel message by the spoken word and by living out the word of God, he is also being a witness to those that are under him in the Lord. As he begins to, uh, uh, to maintain the purity of the word of God, of the gospel message, and he begins to guide the sheep of God, and at the same time, as he's guiding them in the word, listen to this, the pastor is not guiding them with his ideas. Or is it with his own thoughts? With his own opinions? Because if the pastor were to do that, he, you, you'd be straight away from the gospel. But he's here to keep the purity of the gospel and within the purity of the gospel, guide us and protect us to go higher and higher and higher in God. Isn't that wonderful? So Paul here looks at Titus and he didn't look at his age. But he saw in him a trustworthy leader. And I imagine that within Titus, he saw that he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, more than ever, I cannot stress this enough. It's so important for us to have the Holy Ghost to guide us. It's so important. The appointment of qualified leaders was crucial for protecting the churches in Crete, in this island that we see here. It was crucial for protecting them from false teachers and teachings that had already surmounted to great amounts during that time. Without local leaders, the pastors, to guide and protect them, the members of the churches were vulnerable to the influence of false teachers who might teach doctrines contrary to the gospel message. Doesn't that sound like 2023? It does. It's so amazing when you see the Word of God, it applies to all generations. Now, the appointed elders would be responsible for teaching sound doctrine, protecting the members from false teachings, and they would also play a vital role in helping the members grow spiritually and ensuring a long-term health in the church. Titus had a great job to do. Can you imagine Paul telling him, hey, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving this task to you. You know, years ago when we were called to 
uh, to a church, a little old church in Wildwood, Florida. You ever heard of Wildwood, Florida? It's right there next to the villages. I knew how small it was because after Sunday school, we wanted to go grab a bite. Two o'clock, everything was closed. Everybody went home or either after, I don't know what they did, but it was, it was a small town. And as we see here the importance of Paul leaving Titus, I remember at that time we sold everything we had in California. I told my wife, if it's God's will, we'll sell everything in this yard sale and everything sold, even the car we had sold. So we grabbed our stuff. She was three months pregnant, and we went all the way across the country to Little Wildwood, Florida, to pastor a church. And my father-in-law was with us. I was, what, 21 or 20 years old? And after five days of him being with us, he said, my time is done. I must go home. And you know what happened? The moment he left, I felt the weight of a husband. I said, what am I going to do? I have no job. My job is a pastor. My wife is three months pregnant. I've never been out here alone. I mean, Florida was a whole new, I can say a whole new country to us. And I felt the weight at that moment. I really didn't want him to leave. But he had to leave. But you know, we trusted in God. And you know what? In those four years that we were there, God never left us. Never left us. We never went hungry. None of that ever happened. Why? Because God was with us. And Titus, I imagine, must have felt the same thing. When Paul says, I'm leaving you here, this is your job. But his job was even greater. He was to appoint pastors to these local churches. I know he must have felt the weight, but you know what? Paul trusted in him because he knew that in Titus was a man filled with God's love. Now, Paul instructs him in verse 5. To ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. This task was crucial for establishing qualified leaders in each local church and ensuring, again, the purity of the gospel message. Now, it's noteworthy to know here that Paul specifically instructed Titus to appoint elders. Then he says, as I had appointed you. Listen to what he's telling him. This indicates that Titus was to follow the same criteria, the same qualifications for leadership that Paul had established. And who taught it to Paul? Jesus. Paul was taught all of this. And thus Titus knew that he was not to appoint leaders based on his personal preferences, but to carefully discern and select qualified individuals who fit the criteria that Paul had left him. Listen, it was not based on personal preferences. He was not supposed to appoint people, oh, because he's my friend, or because he's my sister or my brother, or oh, because I get along with him better. No, Paul was to appoint them according to the qualifications, Titus, the qualifications that Paul had left him. In the following verses, it outlines the qualifications for church leadership. What does it say? It underscores the importance of applying qualified leaders who are committed to sound doctrine, and not just that, but to also living godly lives. Overall, Paul's uh, instruction to Titus signifies that leadership in the church and the crucial role that it qualifies leaders and that the crucial role that they play in maintaining spiritual health in the church. So he tells him, appoint elders in every city. Now, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us clearly here why these local churches didn't have pastors. You ever thought about that? Well, why were these local churches without pastors? Maybe they were, they were startups that had just started in those areas. Maybe something that happened before Paul and them went to that era. We don't know. But what we do know is that Paul knew that it was important to put things in order and the structure and the government of the church to begin to function the way it's supposed to biblically. And that will take us to verse 6. And now we begin in verse 6 to see what type of leaders he is to appoint. 
First, he says, if any be blameless, and we'll talk about that word blameless. Then he says, they got to be the husband of one wife. Then he says, they have to be, they have to have faithful children. And he also must be not accused of riot or un. Really, so we'll we'll talk about those words when you see this in the Bible. You say, "What is it? What is a pastor, or, or what is leadership supposed to look like in the church today?" This is how it's supposed to look like, and you see, this is beautiful because we don't get our resources or our outlines uh, for true leadership outside of the Bible. We get it within the Bible, and the qualifications for leaders, specifically for elders was these that he said to him. First, he emphasizes blameless. Husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Now, these qualifications have enduring relevance. You know why? Because they still remain applicable to church leadership today. Isn't that wonderful? They still remain applicable to us. Oh, that was that was the, the in the island of Crete. That was their leader. No, 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 no. That's for us. That's for qualified leadership today. The Bible's pattern for church government and structure provides the best guide for us. Now, let's look at the word blameless. So why do you say first eight? Hey, they got to be blameless. He tells him, according to Paul, being blameless meant, and in the Greek, having a good reputation, moral integrity, and a godly character. Wow. Listen to that. For an elder or pastor to be considered blameless, their life should reflect a dedication to living in a way that is pleasing to God and it aligns with the teachings of Christ. In other words, their character, the way they conduct themselves, should be consistent with the values and beliefs that are found in the Bible. They should strive to live a life that is beyond reproach. Now here's the question. Is this just for elders and pastors? <laughs> you know, I had a, a good friend Good Baptist friend. I love Baptists. I love everybody. I just want you to know that. But it was funny because we disagreed on the topic of social drinking. We disagreed on that topic. And the easiest way I could explain it, I said, well, I hold to a, a, a Puritan stance. No alcohol, no wine, no nothing. And she said, well, my husband does too. That's why when we go camping, he asked me to go get the beer so he doesn't have to touch it or get seen buying the beer because he's a deacon. And I said, no, it, this, this doesn't apply to him. It applies to you. It applies to everybody. And when we read this here, a lot of people think, oh, well, those are the qualifications for leadership or pastor. I'm never going to be a leader or a pastor. No, it applies to you too. It applies that you are to live a blameless life. What does that mean? That your character and your conduct should consist of what is written in the Bible. And that many times you don't even have to speak up or say anything. The way you walk, people can tell you're walking with God. You ever been in a situation where people look at you, you don't even have to say nothing, and they know you're a Christian. Because there's something that you have that is even the way you remember when when uh, Peter in the night where they're, they're, um, Jesus is going through his trial and he's running away and he said he's one of them he speaks just like them and he tried to deny he said no, I'm not one of them yeah you speak like them and he's saying the same thing here he's saying not just for leadership this is for everybody now should living a blameless life be limited only to church elders. And pastors? No. The scripture tells us, look at what Romans 15, 4 says, for whatsoever things were written a fourth time. In other words, what was written before were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 
So Paul was referring specifically, yeah, at his time to the Old Testament, as the New Testament was being written out and lived out in his time. However, those words apply to us today. What is written in here is written for our learning. That through the Scriptures, not through the, the elders or the pastors, but through the Scriptures, because sometimes elders and pastors will fail us. Leadership will fail us. But when our eyes are on the Scriptures, they are on Jesus. And it is through Him that Paul says, it is through those Scriptures that you will have hope for eternity. It is through the Scriptures. So it's very clear to us. And since the canon of Scripture closed with the completion of the Old and New Testament, it is meant today that we are to take comfort and patience in the Word of God. So important. Now, so this is not just limited to them. So he says, first, there got to be blameless, Titus. Then he says, number two, the husband of one wife. And remember, when you read the qualifications of a bishop, which is also an elder or a pastor, he talks about being a husband of one wife. So marriage was important. You, you're going to notice that when, when he's giving out all these different qualifications, the first word that came to my mind was family, his home life, his marriage, his children. Very important because, you know, the mother that, and I'll tell you something, those mothers that stay at home when the husband works, they have a harder job than the husband that works out in the field. Because not only are they working at home, not only are they helping the children, but her children are her little church. Those are her disciples. She is discipling them according to the word of God. And he says the husband of one wife. So another qualification requires those who are appointed at that time, he's saying, and even today, who had to be faithful to their wives. Now, this was uncommon in the society at that time. And you know what? It remains uncommon today. You see unfaithfulness everywhere you go. However, the requirement serves as an example for us today to live a life of faithfulness, not only as a pastor to his wife, but also to Christ. We are supposed to live faithful to him. The faithfulness of an elder or a pastor to his wife, plays a vital role in preaching the gospel message. And it's true. Those of you that have been in leadership or those of you that have had to come up and preach or teach something, it just doesn't feel right to be at odds with your wife or your husband and then come up here and try to teach. It don't feel good at all. And this is what it's saying here. His faithfulness to his wife helps him demonstrate the faithfulness needed to be faithful to Christ and no one else. By being an example of faithfulness in his marriage, he's telling Titus that he can more effectively preach and teach the gospel to others as he already embodies the qualities that Christ desires in his followers. How can the pastor then teach to love the church as the bride of Christ if he's not demonstrating that in his own home to his wife. Because that's his first ministry. It's his marriage. It's his children. That's the first ministry. Now, then it goes on to the children. Having faithful children. And these are... If you were to look at these qualities today, and really print them out and give them to modern Christianity today, they would say, we're crazy. They would say, well, nobody can live those standards. But if it's in the Word of God, having faithful children, so the requirement for church leaders that we have seen so far highlights, listen to this, the vital role of family life and leadership. As the Bible reminds us, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Listen to what, that's, that's Paul speaking there. If he doesn't know how to rule his own house, in other words, if he is not focused on that ministry, that ministry of family, then it will be very difficult for him to take care of God's church. You know why? Because God's church is precious. 
in Jesus' eyes. That's His bride. And if I can't take care of the bride that I have here, how can I tell you to take care of the bride of Christ? How to live out the life of a true leader in the Word of God. It begins at home. That's where it begins. That's where leadership begins, at home. With your marriage, that's where it begins. With your children, that's where it begins. That's a great responsibility. And when we face God, one-on-one -on -one with God, we're going to be responsible for those children that God placed under our care. We will. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And this verse emphasizes the importance of family life in the role that parents play in shaping the spiritual and moral character of their children. It also shows us the need for church leaders to be models of Christian character, not only in the public ministry, but also in their personal lives, including their relationships with their family. Now, I know that we're not going to get along with everybody. We know that's true, right? Somebody said, he said, I don't got a lot of enemies. But I got a lot of people who don't like me. I don't really don't understand what he was trying to say, but we're not going to get along with everybody. But what we're saying is that we have to look at people beyond what we see in front of us. We don't desire our worst enemy to go to hell. We don't desire that. You got to look beyond all of that. We talked about it in our Sunday school. teacher, she talked about, we have to look beyond this. This is not them. This is the enemy trying to interrupt our walk with God. And he's telling Titus, look, this is what it takes. And this is just verse 6. And he ain't even got to the, to the wives yet or to the sisters in church yet. He hadn't even got to the youth yet. He's, he's, he's going he's to lay it all out to us in the book of Titus. You know why I chose to do this sermon series? Because it's only three chapters. Imagine we would have done all the book of Psalms. <laughs> there was this pra pastor that went up one day, and, and it's a true story. He said, well, he goes, that is the last book, amen. 22 years took him to preach the whole Bible in his church. He said, I'm glad for those that stuck it out in these 22 years. Some have gone on to be with the Lord. 22 years it took him to preach the whole Bible. Verse by verse by verse. Isn't that wonderful? Now, he talks about this, and it also underscores the need for church leaders, like I said, to be models of Christian character, not only in the public, but also in their personal life and their relationships in their families. We're going to conclude soon here. Overall, the requirement for church leaders serve as a reminder of the high calling and responsibility that you and I have. You see how I changed it up there? Not just the leaders and pastors. The high calling and responsibility that you and I have. The importance of family life. Personal character and fulfilling their, their calling. And then he says that these elders or pastors should not be accused of riot or unruly. You see, the word riot there doesn't mean what it means today in our modern time. When we think riot, we think about everybody going crazy in the street and breaking windows and everything. You know, thing you, things we're seeing everywhere now. But when it, the word here translated in Greek is astoia, which means that an elder or pastor should not be living a luxurious lifestyle. Listen to this. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, hey, you shouldn't be living this type of life. It's not saying that if I can afford to live a certain way, then God has blessed me to live that way. No, what it's saying is going above and just, and then it turns into vanity. And you can't help others that way because you're so consumed with everything, all your materialism. It means that an elder pastor so what Paul is saying here, he's warning the same thing that he told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. It warned him against the dangers of the love of money, which can lead to spiritual harm, temptation, and ruin. The pursuit of riches 
that can lead to foolish and harmful desires and the cause that can cause people to wander from the faith. Instead, we're called to do what? To pursue the things of God and to be content with what we have. Paul said on one occasion, I've learned to live in all sorts of situations, in good and bad. He knew, you know why? Because he was anchored on God. Hey, I use that. He was anchored on God and nothing else. Another word here, he talks about unruly. It describes a person that cannot be controlled or disobedient. So imagine, Titus appoints pastors that are uncontrollable. You say one thing and they get all crazy with you. You say, no, you say, wait a minute, you gotta you're going to be a pastor, you got to control that temper. You got to put it under subjection to the Holy Ghost and say, Holy Ghost, help me to understand this. He describes a person that cannot be controlled or disobedient. So this qualification emphasizes the importance of, look, self-control and obedience in the life of a church leader and us. How many of us need a little more self-control sometimes? Huh? We've all been through that. We need a little self-control. You know, a little, a little me and Jesus time, they call it. A little, let me go into my prayer closet and just give it all over to him at this moment. And, and he's, saying, he's telling Titus the same thing. A leader who is given to disobedience or rebellion is not fit to lead and govern the church. It says it. And may cause harm to the church's witness and effectiveness in the community. The requirement for leaders to avoid being accused of unruliness underscores the importance of the personal character and conduct of a person out there in the world. It's not just in these four walls. We have to be the same person in these four walls that we are outside of these four walls. There shouldn't be two different Brother Nathans. Oh, Brother Nathan in church is this way, and outside of church he's another way. No. And for those that don't know, I'm Nathan. Don't think I'm talking. Who's talking about Brother Nathan? I wonder who Brother Nathan is. <laughs> you got to be the same person. Inside and out. So he's telling Titus, hey, blameless husband of one wife. Not a writer. In other words, he's saying, hey, this person has to live for God. Amen? And I love this last part here. We talked about it in Sunday school. That word unruly in Greek is a military term. And it means that he should be arranged in a troop division in a military fashion under the command of a leader. So he's saying, what's the opposite of unruly? Organized. To be able to walk under the government of God's church. In non-military use, it is a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and at the same time, carrying the burden of the work of God's church. That's the type of leader he's telling Titus. I want you to look for those men. And if Paul gave him the requirements of those types of leaders to look for, it meant that there was men that were living right for God. And we know men that have lived right for God. Sometimes we feel like because a lot of the leaders that we know fail time and time and time again. No, there are men and women that are living for God today. That are doing their best to live for God. Those are the people that you got to stick close to. Those are the people that you got to have conversations with. Those are the people that you got to get closer to and say, what are you doing to live for God? How can I learn from you? To live for God. And we'll look at that more in Titus when he says to the older sister to teach the younger sisters. Huh? Mentorship. You remember that? We used to have that back in the church years ago. An elder sister would take under her wings a group of sisters and teach them the ways of the Lord. One old preacher once said, he said, I'll tell you something about those elderly sisters. He said, I went to church, and the day I got saved, they had an altar call. This was old Bishop M.C. Jackson was his name. 
And he went up to the altar and he said, I was praying. He said, I was about ready to get done. And I felt the old lady's hand straight on my head. She said, don't get up till you get saved. <laughs> he said, I got saved and I got up. She said, stay down till you get sanctified. <laughs> and he said, by the time I got up, I was saved, sanctified, and I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, those old ladies did not leave me alone. They didn't want me to get off that altar until I got what God had for me. Amen. That's what we need. We need some of that. Amen. Of course, the truth with love. With love. For care for their souls. So what Paul is telling Timothy here, there's more qualifications. You think we're done with that? No, there's more. But what Paul is telling him here is saying, hey, I want you to appoint these men because the task was important. The pastor is responsible for those under his care. And their blood is on his hands. If he leads them right, you know, that's a great responsibility. And not just for the pastors, but for you and I also. I want you to rise with us. Let's, let's thank the Lord. Sister Lisa, if you can help us.